I've left mission-driven nonprofit jobs twice, and both times it was really stressful to wrap up my work and get out the door. It was emotionally taxing to leave jobs that I really believed in once upon a time. I'd been so committed to the mission in both instances and so full of hope that I would make a difference when I'd started. My experiences, naturally, shaped my beliefs around mission-driven work. I've concluded that people don't leave mission-driven work because they no longer believe in the mission. People leave mission-driven work because they no longer believe in the organization. But I've left these jobs voluntarily and had the opportunity to disconnect from the mission that drove me to be there. And I haven't experienced being removed from that work against my will. For Brandon Walters, being forced out of his mission-driven work following a psychiatric disorder diagnosis was simply untenable. So he hatched a plan to try and make his Air Force colleagues regret letting him go. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. Brandon Walters served eight years as an electronics technician in the United States Navy, But something inspired the 28-year-old to try a slightly different shade of blue, and on May 8, 2001, Walters joined the U.S. Air Force. Shortly thereafter, he arrived at the Lackland Air Force Base Medina Annex to take an electronics course. Lackland Air Force Base, nicknamed the Gateway to the Air Force, remains the only basic military training installation for both the Air and Space Forces. Air Force Basic Military Training is a seven-week program that provides basic physical and combat training for recruits enlisting in the service. In addition to the physical side of things, recruits receive training on ceremonies, Air Force core values, and a range of subjects related to Air Force life. There are also a variety of other training programs and courses offered on the base for members of the Air and Space Forces and some that are open to all branches of the military. Walters began exhibiting erratic behavior towards others on the base pretty much from the get-go. In fact, Walters was brought to my attention by a listener who remembers him from his inbound processing at the base 23 years ago. The legal beagle was curious to know more about what's happened in the last few decades. Walters was unfocused, unkempt, and unable to keep his hands to himself, touching things that didn't belong to him. The personnel manager for his course, First Sergeant Janet McWilliams, observed that wherever Walters went, she'd get a phone call. He was rude, complained about his roommate, and stole food. Perhaps even more concerning, Walters had a little hint of power. Given his prior enlistment in the Navy, Walters had seniority in his class. So, when an instructor left the classroom one day, Walters was technically in charge. With just this little suggestion of power, he ordered his classmates to swab the decks. When they didn't respond, because why would they, he angrily repeated himself. The students were worried that Should they introduce water into their electronics classroom, they'd risk electrocution. Walters then began yelling so loudly that another class leader came running in. 
This was the last straw and the incident that forced First Sergeant McWilliams to recommend evaluation at Wilford Hall Medical Center. McWilliams wanted to make sure that Walters was fit for duty. Walters told her that both she and his fellow students who complained about him were in big trouble because there was nothing wrong with him. Walters spent three weeks in the hospital before doctors diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder, identified that he was potentially dangerous, and recommended that he be medically discharged from the service. Walters complained that everyone was ruining his career. Following the doctor's recommendation, the Air Force dismissed him in June 2001. In episode 20, The Easterly Case, I talked about how some medical conditions like Easterly's schizophrenia are disqualifying medical conditions. Walter's diagnosis, marked by grandiose behavior and a lack of empathy, was one of them. McWilliams and another airman met with Walters to give him his discharge packet and to get his military ID back. At that meeting, Walters claimed he'd lost his credentials and then became irate and disrespectful before threatening McWilliams. On his way out of the meeting, Walters said he would set off a bomb on the airplane back home just to show McWilliams that she couldn't control him anymore. To return Walters to his home of record in Utah, The Air Force purchased the one-way ticket for his return, and to help safeguard McWilliams and others, he was escorted to the airport, where he refused to board his flight. He escaped from his escort and checked into the Cactus Hotel in San Antonio for $8 a night. The hotel owner recalled Walters using his allegedly missing military ID to check in. On Monday, July 30th, 2001, one of the instructors at Lackland saw someone walking down the hall of a classroom building wearing civilian clothes. The instructor greeted the casually dressed man who ignored the hello. A student later discovered a brown package the size of a shoebox addressed to First Sergeant Janet McWilliams in one of the schoolhouse men's bathrooms. The return address read First Sergeant's Association and indicated it was sent from Claremont, Idaho. The student gave the package to his supervisor, who placed it in the intra-base mail for delivery. The package made it to First Sergeant McWilliams at the Medina Annex the following day, Tuesday, July 31st. When she opened it, she observed a confusing mix of Martha Stewart hand lotion, coins, metal objects, and wires. Then the package exploded, and the base quickly entered lockdown. First Sergeant McWilliams watched as she lost her left hand and three fingers from her right hand. Shrapnel damage to her abdomen led to the loss of her belly button, and she sustained significant damage to her right eye. The force of the blast blew out both of her eardrums, and her lungs sustained damage as she inhaled flash burns. She endured powder burns over much of her body. But she remained conscious and called out for help. Her office neighbor ran in and observed McWilliams smoldering from the burns. He picked her up and carried her outside the building, and she asked someone to please go look for her left hand, her dominant hand, and her missing fingers, in hopes they could be reattached. When first responders arrived, they asked McWilliams if she knew of anyone who could have possibly sent her a bomb. She identified Walters. When they were given the all-clear, her colleagues entered her office and retrieved her wedding ring. The damage to her hand and fingers was too extensive, and they could not be reattached. During surgery, doctors removed coins from her body that had been used as shrapnel. 
It was the first of 29 operations McWilliams endured during her recovery. Three months after the bombing, McWilliams resumed her duties as first sergeant. On August 1st, the day after the bombing, federal agents arrived at the Cactus Hotel and caught Walters as he attempted to run out the back door. They told him they wanted to talk, and he allegedly attacked one of the agents and was subsequently arrested. FBI agents later searched his hotel room with a bomb-sniffing dog and discovered part of a Panasonic battery box, two fragments of a steel bottle, nickels, part of a battery, a capacitor, an end cap for an automobile dome light, epoxy plug, wires, and dental floss used in a booby trap trigger device. In addition to this variety of parts, they found tools. Specifically, they found a Leatherman multipurpose tool and a soldering iron. Embedded in the room's carpet were remnants of melted solder. These were consistent with the items used in the bomb that detonated in First Sergeant McWilliams' office. After Walters had refused to board his flight and escaped his escort, He gathered his bomb-making supplies and got to work. He padlocked his door at the Cactus Hotel and refused to let housekeeping or anyone else enter during his 30-day stay. Walters made full use of the rest of the staff, though, and visited the front desk to ask if they knew where he could purchase fireworks. One of the front desk clerks recalled hearing firecrackers exploding in his room on a few separate occasions. Although housekeeping wasn't welcome in his room, Walters took out his own trash, which struck another hotel guest as odd because he wore latex gloves while he did so. When he'd completed his device, he wrapped it in a brown paper package drove on base with the military ID he hadn't surrendered, and left the package in the men's bathroom of the schoolhouse. After he dropped off the bomb, he returned to the Cactus Hotel to make sure he was successful. On July 31st, as local news picked up the story of a bomb detonating at Lackland and the subsequent lockdown, Walters sat in the lobby and watched. It was the only time during his stay that he lounged in the lobby. After searching the hotel room, FBI agents searched Walter's grandmother's home and his mother's home back in Utah. His grandmother described a work area in her basement as Brandon's area. There, agents discovered the remnants of hundreds of firecrackers, bottle rockets, and other fireworks, alongside ammunition, a timing device, wire wire cutters, batteries, transistors, a roll of solder, and pieces of circuit board from a disposable camera. Many of these items were also consistent with the bomb that detonated in McWilliams' office. At his mother's home, they discovered his personal copy of the anarchist cookbook. In case you thought to yourself that it could be anyone's copy of an instruction manual for bomb making, among other things, it's important to know that Walters wrote his name on the inside cover. I dove down an interesting rabbit hole on the anarchist cookbook, so I'm going to take us on a slight detour to share what I found. It's not illegal for unincarcerated people to own or download a copy of the literature. It's protected speech under the First Amendment. However, if investigators discover a copy while searching a home or computer, it can be seized and used as evidence in any subsequent trial. Relatedly, the prosecutors did end up introducing the title of the book, the page Walters wrote his name on, and the chapter with instructions on making certain bombs. Federal prosecutors in Texas charged Walters with five violations of the federal code. These included assault on a federal officer, McWilliams, damaging a federal building, the base, possession of an unregistered firearm, and two counts of using a destructive device, 
for the assault on McWilliams and the damage to the base. A month before trial, prosecutors wrote to Walter's counsel to disclose information about William Bott, someone who had previously worked on the base as well. The government disclosed that Bott allegedly told a co-worker that he'd thought about hiding a bomb in a men's restroom at Lackland. That seems like a very specific thing to mention to a colleague. Attached to the letter was a copy of the telephone interview conducted with Bott, who denied making any such threats. Walter's counsel requested a continuance to dig into this potentially exculpatory evidence, but their request was denied. At trial, Walters argued that the bomb fragments recovered from the scene were made from generic materials and couldn't definitively be linked to Walters. The trial lasted just two days in June 2002, and the jury convicted Walters of all five counts after less than two hours of deliberation. McWilliams arrived in full military dress to deliver her victim impact statement. She asked that Walters receive the maximum penalty, life in prison. The district judge sentenced Walters to 21 years and 10 months for the assault, damaging the building, and possession of an unregistered firearm, 30 years for the use of a destructive device in the assault on McWilliams, and life in prison for the use of a destructive device to damage a federal building. Before we get any further, I want to explain that last piece a little bit. I don't want it to sound like the damage to the physical building was more important than the life-altering assault on McWilliams. 18 U.S. Code Section 924C governs the use of a destructive device, like a bomb, in relation to crimes of violence. That section carries a 30-year mandatory minimum for a first offense, and a mandatory life sentence for a second offense. The district court sentenced Walters for a first offense and a second offense simultaneously and related to the same incident. Before I break for the legal beagle section, I want to give an update on McWilliams, who has since retired from the Air Force. Nine years after she opened the bomb when she was 59 years old, she became the first woman to receive a hand transplant in the United States. Her surgical team prepared for 18 months and performed the surgery over the course of nine hours, replacing McWilliams' left hand with a donor hand. Two weeks after the surgery, McWilliams began to experience some movement in her new thumb and fingers. At a press conference after her surgery, she expressed her profound joy that she'd soon be able to wear her engagement ring and wedding band again. I wanted to be sure to include this, because McWilliams credits her recovery, of course, to her own personal determination, but largely to the loving attention of her husband, Dan. In his first appeal to the Fifth Circuit, Walters argued that the court shouldn't have admitted anything related to the anarchist cookbook, that prosecutors committed a discovery violation while disclosing information about Bott, the man who allegedly made a threat about leaving a bomb in a men's bathroom, and that it was error to allow two convictions under Section 924C for the use of a single destructive device. The Fifth Circuit panel offered an extensive history of defendants found in possession of the anarchist cookbook and other similar how-to guides who went on to challenge the admission of the literature at trial. The overwhelming historical trend weighed against Walter's argument and the court explained that the district court limited the admitted portions focusing on the page Walters wrote his name on and only the portion of the book about bombs that were similar to the one Walters left on base. They concluded that even if it had been error to admit portions of the book, Walters certainly wouldn't have been able to show prejudice because the evidence against him was overwhelming. 
The court went on to conclude there was no discovery violation and that Walters and his defense team had sufficient time to prepare for trial after receiving the notification about the allegation against Bott. The meat of the first appeal focused on the double conviction arising from the use of a single bomb. Section 924 makes it illegal to use a destructive device in a crime of violence. Walters, you'll remember, suffered two convictions under this section, one for the assault on McWilliams and one for the damage to the building. The offenses occurred simultaneously with the single explosion of a single bomb. Prior to Walter's case arriving at the Fifth Circuit, they had ruled that punishment cannot be based on multiple Section 924C convictions for a single use of a destructive device to accomplish multiple offenses. In applying this precedent that they'd recently set, the Circuit Court vacated the sentences related to the Section 924C convictions and remanded the case to the District Court for resentencing. At resentencing, Walters faced a statutory minimum for the 924C convictions. The government argued that the guideline-based sentencing wouldn't be appropriate and requested a non-guideline sentence of life imprisonment. The district court declined that invitation and sentenced Walters to his original term of 21 years 10 months for the other convictions and 60 years for the use of the destructive device, that 924C conviction, and ruled they were to be served consecutively. Walters again appealed to the Fifth Circuit, arguing that the sentence was unreasonable. The Circuit Court reviews sentencing outside the advisory guidelines for an abuse of discretion. The District Court, during the resentencing hearing, explained that it imposed the lengthy sentence to protect the public and highlighted that the crime involved the use of a bomb. But this explanation that the district court offered was not quite adequate for the circuit court to uphold the sentence. The district court, they concluded, didn't fully address why 60 years as opposed to the guideline recommendation of 30 was appropriate. The discussion about the nature of the bomb was, as the circuit court observed, common to all bomb crimes and didn't show why Walter's crime was different and worth double the minimum. So, in 2007, the circuit court again vacated the sentence and remanded it for resentencing. In 2008, the district court was clear and offered a thorough explanation according to each of their factors to be considered in selecting a non-guideline sentence. It didn't go well for Walters. As a refresher, his first sentence on the destructive device convictions was life in prison. His second sentence was 60 years. In the final go-around having considered all factors relevant to the calculation, the court imposed a non-guideline 820-month term, or 68 and one-third years, served consecutively to the approximately 22-year sentence on the other convictions. In another appeal to the Fifth Circuit, Walters argued that the district court committed procedural error by increasing his sentence on this go-around, and that the district court failed to consider his total sentence. It's interesting to me that he chose this as his argument because I think it's abundantly clear that the district court was considering the total sentence Walters was subject to. Walters was previously subject to life in prison, and when life in prison was no longer supported by the convictions, the district court found a way to get much closer to it. The Fifth Circuit concluded at last that the district court found Walter's actions indicated a level of dangerousness that required a higher sentence to protect the public, and that the non-guideline sentence was necessary to serve the interests of deterrence. The district court, they observed, was in a much better position to judge Walter's and the circumstances of the offense, and to give reasons for imposing the sentence they did. The circuit court did not find an abuse of discretion, and affirmed the sentence. Thank you for listening.
If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. I invite you to submit case suggestions and feedback to contactunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on contactunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when we delve into the disastrous consequences of a bruised ego. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct and Becoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.